Okay, in this video, we're going to cover 3.3, which is the introduction to quadratic functions and models. So we've seen quadratics um, used in real life situations. We've seen quadratics um, expressions. We've solved our quadratic equations using multiple different strategies to solve uh, quadratic equations. But now what we're going to do is examine quadratics as functions. Um, and what those graphs would look like, some details about those graphs, and then um, how we can use that information to find like maximum and minimum values of quadratic models, okay? Um, so the graph of a quadratic function starts with this part, and it says, in this section, you will study the graphs of polynomial functions. You have been introduced to the following basic functions like linear functions, constant functions, and even the squaring function. These functions are examples of polynomial functions. The definition of a polynomial function is this, where you can have any greatest exponent with its um, coefficient, and then the exponents will decrease in power until you're down to the squared power, the first power, and then x to no power, zero power, okay? Um, those are all called polynomials polynomial functions, okay? Polynomial functions are classified by your degree. So if you do have um, the degree of one, you're talking about just x to the one power, which is a linear function. If you're talking about x to the zero power, you're just talking about the constant function. But if you're talking about a function with a degree of two, then those are what are we describe as quadratic functions. Okay, so you've got degree of zero is a constant, degree of one is a linear, and then degree of two is a quadratic. Degree of three would be a, a, a cubic. Um, and then after that, they're all just pretty much from three on, they're called just polynomials, okay? Um, so in this section, we're gonna go further into the discussion of quadratic functions. So for instance, each of the following functions is a quadratic function. This one happens to have A, B, and C. This one, if I FOIL it out, distribute my two and combine my like terms, will also have an A, B, and C. This one does have an A and a C. It doesn't have a B. Notice it doesn't have another term with a number in front of X, but it does have a constant C, which is nine. Here's the same situation. It's got the a x squared. There's no b x term, but you do have the constant four. And here, if I were to FOIL this out, combine all my like terms, I would have an x squared term, um, an x term, and then a constant term. And note that in every single one of these quadratics, the highest exponent of x is two, meaning that that quadratic function has a degree of two. So definition of the quadratic function is this, where of course a cannot be equal to zero, you must have an x squared function. You can be missing the um, constant and still be called the quadratic. You could be missing the x term and still be called the quadratic. You could even be missing both the x term and the constant term and still be called the quadratic. The only thing you can't be missing is the x squared term because then it's no longer a quadratic. It's either a linear or a constant term, a constant function. So um, the graph of a quadratic function is represented or it draws a U-shaped curve, okay? And this U-shaped curve is called a parabola. And parabolas occur in many real life applications, especially those involving reflective properties of satellite dishes and flashlight reflectors. Um, Let's keep going. So here it says all parabolas are symmetric with respect to a line called the axis of symmetry or simply the axes of the hyperbola. So I don't ever just call it the axes because we already have axes like the x axes and the y axes. So I usually when I'm referring to the axes of symmetry, I will say the entire phrase axes of symmetry. Um, the point where the axes of symmetry intersects the parabola. So this parabola looks the same if I were to cut it in half here and then fold it onto itself. So that is therefore the line of axes of symmetry. Um, but if you look at that point where it intersects that line of axes of symmetry, that point is called your vertex. 
even if the parabola were facing downward, it doesn't necessarily look like a U shape anymore, but it is facing downward. Um, you still have that line in the middle, which makes it symmetric on both sides. And where you intersect that line is still called the vertex. When the leading coefficient is positive, the graph of the function um, is a parabola that opens upward. When the leading coefficient is negative, the graph of the function will open downward, okay? So, and the simplest type of quadratic function would be that that doesn't have the bx or the constant term. Um, so we know that its graph is a parabola whose vertex is at zero, zero, okay? When you have just y equal to um, ax squared, okay, and a is positive. Okay, then it will open up like that and the vertex will be at zero, zero. Now, if you had the function um, ax squared, but the a was negative, then it would be opening downward, but again, the vertex would still be at zero, zero, okay? Now, for example, one, it says sketch the graph of each quadratic function and compare it with the graph of x squared. So here's the graph of x squared, this, this one here. And they graphed x squared on there, and then they're graphing the next one. Now, the typical points that we always use when we're graphing just x squared is going to be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And for x squared, just x squared, when you square negative two, you get four, when you square negative one, you get one, zero, zero, one, one, and two, four. So you're always going to have those points, two and four, negative two and four, and then one and one, and negative one and one, and then of course, zero, zero. And so your x squared function is always going to have those same five points. Now, if you wanted to compare that to a, which is one and one third, you're going to make the same table with the same x values, but your y values are gonna be different because you have a, a, a coefficient here, a different coefficient than there. There the coefficient is an invisible one, whereas here your coefficient is one third. So when I square, let's see, um, one fraction three, and we're gonna square negative two. When we plug that in, we get four thirds, which is about 1.3. Then when we go back and we plug in negative one, we get one third, which is about 0 0.3. When we plug in zero, we get zero. When we plug in one, we get one third, which is about 0 0.3. And when we plug in two, we get four thirds again, which is about 1.3, okay? And so then if I plot those points, I have negative two and 1.3, which is a little bit higher about right there, positive two and 1.03. And then negative one and 0.3, and positive one and 0.3, and then of course zero zero. And so then that creates this bottom graph at the that's in pink here. Okay, so this is the function one third of x squared. Okay, and so you can note you can see that it looks like it opens up wider. Okay, it still has the same vertex. It's just opening up to be wider. It's like the bowl is a lot wider than, than the original bowl, okay? This bowl was longer, right? It had more depth to the bowl. And this one is has a smaller, shorter depth, but the bowl opening is wider, okay? Um, similarly for this one, if we look at the regular table compared to the new table, 
So negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two for just x squared, we know gives us this output. And then if we make a similar table, but for the function two x squared, we have negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. Um, we're basically taking all of the x squared guys and multiplying them by two. So we'll get eight, two, zero, two, and eight. And if you don't believe me, you can just type them in here, right? Two parentheses, negative two squared, um, and then see what you get, clear? Oh, I forgot to put a two. There we go, we get eight, okay? Um, and they can change it to negative one and get the two, change that in there to zero, you should get zero, change that in here and get to one and you should get two, change that in here to positive two and you should get positive eight. Um, and so then if I plot these, the originals, negative two and four is about right there, um, negative one and one, zero and zero, one and one, two and four. And so that would create this graph of y equals x squared. And then for the new one, we have negative two and eight, which is probably way up here somewhere. Then negative one and two, zero, zero, one and two, and then two and eight, which is probably up here somewhere. And so you get this parabola that goes in this manner, okay? And so notice that this one makes the graph look narrower than the original, right? Um, so what is the difference between the coefficient that this one makes it look wider and this one makes it look more narrow, okay? Well, the difference is, is that this coefficient is a number between um, zero and one. It's not zero because then it wouldn't be a quadratic and it's not one because then it would be just X squared, okay? But it's a coefficient um, between zero and one and that makes the graph look wider. Then if you have a number that is greater than one, that's going to make the graph look more narrow. Basically what's happening is that the Y values are getting large faster. And here the Y values are getting large slower than the regular x squared. Okay, so in example one, note that the coefficient a does determine how wide the parabola will open, okay? Um, so when this number is small, the parabola opens wider, and when this value is large, um, the graph will be more narrow, okay? Um, that is one kind of transformation. Some other kinds of transformations are if I happen to add or subtract something from X, if I happen to add or subtract something from the final output, or if I happen to change the sign of the input, or if I happen to change the sign of the outputs. Um, all of these are considered rigid transformations of the graph um, Y equals F of X. So for instance, in the figures below, notice how the graph of y equals x squared can be transformed to produce the graphs of negative x squared plus one. So here you have a negative x squared, that means you made your outputs negative. So instead of all of them being positive outputs up here, now they're going to be negative outputs going downward, but then you add one to the y outputs. So that means every single output is going to go up one unit in which you eventually end up with this um, black parabola there, okay? Whereas here, you add or subtract something to the input, that's actually gonna shift this whole thing over to the left two units, so then it would look like this. And then because they're minusing three to that final output, all of those values would be shifted down three units, which would land you on top of this black parabola. Now I'll talk more about how you'll know whether it shifts this way, that way, and whatnot um, when we get further into transformations. So the standard form of a quadratic function looks like this. And essentially what that is, is the way the function looks after you complete the square, okay? So if you do apply your completing the square techniques, you may have to modify it just a little bit but for the most part, um, you should be able to get this by completing the square, okay? 
And the cool thing about having a quadratic formula in that completed square form, also known as standard form, is that it does help you define what the, what the vertex is. So if you do get it in this form, this number here would be the x value of the vertex. And then this number out here would be the y value of the vertex. One important thing to um, recognize is that in here, notice that the h is negative, but in the point, it's positive. So whatever value you have in here, it's going to be the opposite when you actually figure out the coordinates of the vertex. And then notice here, it's positive k, and it's also positive k in here. So when you're identifying the y value of the vertex, it's going to be the exact same sign as what's out here, okay? So um, remember, A will tell you whether the parabola is going to open upward or downward. Um, we also know that the vertex point does also tell us where the axis of symmetry is. Um, and so we can pretty much graph it from just knowing those two bits of information. Um, so to graph the parabola, it's helpful to begin by writing the quadratic function in its standard form using the process of completing the square. Um, and then in the example, notice that the comp when completing the square, you add and subtract the square of half of the coefficient of x within the parentheses instead of adding the value to each side of the equation. We haven't quite seen example two yet, but I'm sure it's coming up, okay? Again, I apologize for all my video game stuff. <laughs> the kids have a mess. Um, so to find the x-intercepts of the graph, f of x, a equals x squared plus bx plus c, you must solve the equation of the quadratic equal to zero. So if you set the whole thing equal to zero, that's how you find the x-intercepts, okay? Um, if it does not factor, then use the quadratic formula to find the x-intercepts. But remember, if your quadratic formula yields complex solutions, then you don't have any x-intercepts. So finally, we get to discuss example two. It says, sketch the graph of this function and identify the vertex and the axes of symmetry of the parabola. So to begin by writing the function in standard form, notice that the first step in completing the square is to factor out any coefficient of x squared. So notice they don't factor it out of all the terms. You only want to worry about these two terms, OK? Um, I've seen people do it different ways, but this is how they're teaching you to do it. Um, but it is what it is, OK? So this is what we have here too. So we're gonna take these two terms and isolate them. And we're basically gonna try to complete the square with those two terms. This plus seven is just gonna keep hanging out on the side until I can do something with it, okay? So they do need to factor out this coefficient. So they factor out the two and they end up with x squared plus four x. Again, the plus seven is just hanging over there on the side, okay? Um, then once they do that, they take this b, it's a positive four. So they take one half of b and they square it, remember? And that's what they're gonna add to both sides. Well, in this case, one half times b, which is a positive four, is actually gonna be a positive two squared, which is actually a positive four. So what that means is that they're gonna add four and subtract four, okay? The reason why you're adding four and subtracting four is because you're not, you don't have an equation where you're adding four on this side and you're adding four on that side, okay? So your line does need to be equivalent to the last line. And if I add four and subtract four, I'm really not adding anything, okay? I'm just making it look like I am. So you do put in the plus four and the minus four inside the parentheses, okay? And then what happens is, is that you only want the plus four to complete the square. So what you do is you wanna kick this guy out of the parentheses. However, remember every single item in this parentheses does need to be multiplied by two. So if you wanna kick out this minus four, you're going to have to multiply it by two. So notice that down here, it's only x squared plus four x and the plus four. And notice that the minus four is kicked out, but they did multiply it by two. And of course that plus seven is just coming along down for the ride, okay? Once it's like that, you can factor what's inside this parentheses here. 
and you can go ahead and um, multiply the two times the four. So in this step, I wouldn't have written this. I would have written x plus two times x plus two from factoring x plus four x plus four. And then if I multiplied those two, I do get eight. And so then if I have x squared plus two times itself, I can write that as x squared plus two squared. And then I can combine these like terms, negative eight plus seven, and just get negative one. Once it's written like that, I can find my vertex. Remember what I mentioned? This guy is going to change sign when you write down the vertex. So since it says plus two, my vertex is actually gonna have an X coordinate of negative two. And then the number here on the outside of the square um, is actually negative one and my Y value of the vertex will be that exact same value, negative one. Also notice that A in the front is two. A equals two, which is greater than zero, which means that the parabola will open upward. Okay, so I know that I have a vertex at negative two, negative one, and I know that it's going to open upward. All I need is one other point in order for me to figure out what this is going to look like. Okay, and so if I'm going to make a chart, if I know that the vertex is at x equals negative two and y equals negative one, then I'm going to pick an x value either to the right or to the left to figure out what the shape is going to look like. So since here's at negative two, I'm going to plug in negative one. So um, two times negative one plus two squared minus one is going to be um, two times negative one plus two squared minus one is just one. And so then I'm gonna have the point negative one and one. And by symmet symmetry, I'm also gonna have the point negative three and one. And that is enough information to draw the parabola, okay? Knowing that it has that symmetry and you know where the vertex is. Okay, so now we're gonna discuss finding minimum and maximum values, okay? So many applications do involve finding maximum and minimum values of a quadratic function. And by completing the square of the quadratic function, you can rewrite the function in its standard form, which kind of looks something like this, okay? You can use this formula to write the standard form. Um, normally, I just apply the completing the square process, but if you want, you could literally just use this formula. Now, what that means is that the, the vertex, if you use that formula, the vertex is always gonna be at this value the opposite of that sign, right? So negative b over 2a. And then if you plug that into the function, that's where this comes from. And so that's actually the y value. If you plug this x value into the function, you get its corresponding y value, okay? Now, one other thing to consider is that when the a is positive, remember that the graph will open upward, meaning that the vertex is actually the minimum value, okay? Whereas if A is negative, then it would be opening downward. And then your vertex is actually the maximum, the highest Y value of that graph, okay? Now the X value is where the maximum or minimum occur at, okay? The Y value is the actual minimum or maximum value. So if they ask you where is the maximum gonna occur, that asking you for the X value. If they ask you what is the maximum or minimum value, then that's asking you for the y value, okay? So where it's gonna happen is the x, what is the value, the max min value is the y. And it's important to know that because you need to know which variable you're trying to find, okay? So for an example three, is the maximum height of a baseball. It says the path of a baseball after hitting being hit is given by the function f of x equals negative 0.0032x squared plus x plus three, where f of x is the height of the baseball in feet and x is the horizontal distance from home plate in feet. What is the maximum height of the baseball? For this quadratic function, you have the function f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c where A is equal to that negative 0 0.0032, B is equal to one, and even you have C equal to three. Now, if I want to find the vertex, 
okay? Um, if I want to find the vertex, I know that it's negative b over 2a. And then if I want the y value, I have to plug that into the function, okay? But this is how you find the vertex. And we know that if the a value is negative, it moves downward like this, and that is the maximum, okay? And so it's asking us, what is the maximum height, okay? Remember, it says f of x is the height. So are they asking me for x or are they asking me for y? They're asking me for the maximum height, which is the max y value, okay? But you can't find the y value until you know what the heck the x value is, okay? Once you know what that x value is, you can plug it in to the function and you'll be able to get that y value, okay? So we're gonna plug x, these values, to calculate x, okay? So x is gonna equal negative of our b value, which is one, over two times our a value. And if you type that whole thing in the calculator, you do get 156.25 feet, okay? So that's where the maximum height is occurring. But if I want the actual maximum height, I have to plug that value into the function to get the maximum height. And so when you plug it in for x, if you do all this calculation, you do end up with this. And this is the maximum height. Okay. So, Let's go ahead and do some practices. So for practice number one, it says write the quadratic function in its standard form. So notice here, you don't have a coefficient that you have to factor out. So I'm just basically going to take the one half times b over, or one half times b squared to figure out what I need to add and subtract to complete the square. So in this case, my b is a negative six. So I get negative three squared, which is actually nine. So my function will become x squared plus six x. I'm gonna scoot the plus two over because it needs to be kicked off to the side. But in order to complete this square, I'm gonna have to add nine. And just to keep this line equivalent to the line before, it, I'm also going to subtract nine, okay? Because then essentially what happens is those cancel and I do have the exact same expression as I had before, okay? But with this in there, it is equivalent to the expression before, it just looks different, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna group these two together and we're gonna group those two together. Now the first two we're gonna factor. So that becomes x plus, or whatever's in this parentheses before you square it. So it's actually x minus three because it's negative squared. And then these, when I combine them, I get negative seven, okay? And I have completed the square. So my quadratic function is in its standard form. Now over here, it's a little bit more complicated because I do have a coefficient in x squared. And so unfortunately, I do have to factor that out. And I am gonna kick the plus one off to the side. And I'm gonna kick it way off to the side, okay? Because I don't know what I'm gonna add and subtract in just a bit. Now, when I factor this seven out, remember what I want is I still want to have, um, oh no, I'm doing the plus and minuses in the wrong spot. Anyway, let me just put the plus one off to the side. So when I factor out the seven, remember it does need to multiply to give me the negative one. So I'm actually gonna do negative one seventh x. So that seven times x squared is seven x squared. And then seven times negative one over seven X is just gonna cancel the sevens and give me that negative one X. And then I have to complete the square. So in this case, I have to take one half times whatever's in front of X, which is negative one seventh and square it. And so what do I get here? One half times negative one seventh is gonna be negative one over 14. And when I square that, I get one over 14 times 14. I get one over 196 positive. So that tells me I'm gonna add one over 196 and I'm gonna subtract one over 196 inside the parentheses, right? So that this line can be equivalent to the previous one, okay? So if these cancel and I distribute back my seven, 
I do have the original, okay? From there, we're gonna kick this second one out. So we're gonna say x squared minus 1 seventh x plus one over 196. And then I'm gonna kick out the one over 196, but I am gonna keep remembering that it has to get multiplied by seven. So then here, we're gonna factor this. We know the trick, right? Whatever we got in the parentheses before we squared it is what's gonna go in here with x. And then here we can compute that. So let's see, um, negative one over 196 times seven plus one. And we get a positive, so a positive 27 over 28. And then this is completed. So we have completed the square, okay? Um, we did put this in the calculator and we got this number, positive, okay? Um, now let's go ahead and move to part number, example three, or practice three. So it says, write the standard form of the quadratic function whose graph is a parabola with a given vertex that passes through the given point. So let x be the independent variable and y be the dependent variable. So remember the standard function, it said f of x equals a x minus h squared plus k. And it said h k was the vertex, okay? So if I do know the vertex, then I know that this is h and this is k. And it doesn't want the dependent variable to be f of x, it wants it to be y. So I'm gonna change that to y. A, I don't know what it is, but I do know I have x minus the negative three squared plus the negative 11, which I can clean up. That's x plus three squared minus 11. Now this is pretty much the equation that they're asking for. The only problem is, is that in order for it to be complete, I do need to know what this a value is, okay? And I can easily figure it out by using the other point. Remember that this is the x value and the y value of a random point. So I can plug in that seven for the y, zero for the x, and then solve the resulting equation because the only variable left is a. So I get seven equals a times three squared. Um, I can add 11 to both sides. So I get 18 equals a times nine. And then if I'm trying to solve for a, I can divide both sides by nine and I get two equals a. And so now I know my equation is gonna be a equals two times x plus three squared minus 11. And this is the function that they want. Okay, so you first plug in your vertex to see what your function would look like, but if you're still missing the a value, you have to go plug in the extra point to go calculate that a value. Okay, now we have one last example in this section, and it says a manufacturer of lighting fixtures has daily production costs of C equal to 800 minus 30x plus 0.25x squared, where C is the total cost in dollars and X is the number of units produced. Um, it says what daily production number yields the minimum cost? So they're asking you for the daily production. What daily production yields a minimum cost? Well, remember X is the number of units produced each day, okay? So they really only wanna know the X value. They're not asking you what is the minimum cost, they're asking you how many units have to be produced to yield the minimum cost. So really they only want the X value of the vertex. And we had a cute little formula for it because we know that the vertex occurs at negative B over two A comma F of negative B over two A. And since I only wanna know the X value of the vertex, I really am only concerned with this value of the vertex. So I really only wanna find where um, this X value. So I do have to identify up here. Remember A is what's in front of X squared. So A equals 0 0.25. B is what's in front of X, which is negative 30. And C is the constant, which happens to be this 800. Now in this formula, it doesn't call for C, it just asks for B. So negative of B over two times A. 
And if I type that in my calculator, we get um, negative of negative 30 over 2 times 0 0.25. And so my calculator tells me that that value is 60. And so 60 units must be produced to yield this minimum cost. And that is the end of this section.